maybe we should just wait a minute in case people for some reason are trying to tune in. The next speaker is David Steven from MPQ and he's going to tell us about subsystem symmetry and rich topological order. So take it away, David. Great. Thanks, Dom. And thanks to Robert and Chihan for organizing this workshop. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. So, um, right. So I wanted to talk about something which is very related to, I guess, what Trithep just talked about. And that's kind of the idea of creating new kinds of topological models using ingredients from existing ones and seeing what kinds of interesting properties they have. Um, and pretty much everything I want you to take from this talk is encoded in this picture here. So hopefully you will uh, understand it um, by the end. And for those of you who aren't so familiar with the physics, I hope you can at least follow my pictures because I aimed to make the talk um, quite um, somewhat simple. Um, right, so to start off, um, subsystem symmetry in which topological order, it kind of just looks like I shoved together a bunch of adjectives here, and in some sense I did, um, but and, um, so first I want to motivate why these are interesting things to shove together and what they all mean. So first off, subsystem is referring to subsystem symmetries, and we already saw some of that in the previous talk. Um, and a subsystem symmetry is somewhere in between a global symmetry, where you act the same way on every site of, say, a lattice system, and a local symmetry, where you just act locally, and instead you act on some lower dimensional subsystem. So in Triteb's talk, we saw some fractals, um, and but we but in 2D, we also have line-like symmetries, where the generators act only on a 1D line of your 2D system. And in 3D, you could have a 2D plane in a 3D system, which is what we will um, mostly be interested in here. And of course, there's many other things you could have. Um, and I want to mention that subsystem symmetries are distinguished by the fact that they are rigid. So there's another no notion of mid-dimensional symmetries where you can kind of have like, you know, lines or membranes which can be deformed. And these are often called higher form symmetries. And these are different and they are much different symmetries that lead to different physics. And so here I'm talking about these rigid symmetries. Um, and in the past couple of years, they've become pretty hot uh, from, from two separate angles, at least. Um, and one of them is that in, in the same way that, that a model with a, a symmetry can be related to a model with, a, uh, or rather a model with a, a global symmetry can be gauged to get a model with a gauge symmetry, which, is often, has, which often has topological order. Um, you can take a model with subsystem symmetries and do an analog of gauging there, and you get out these models of what's called fracton topological order which we've heard of in a couple talks um, during this workshop. And these have exotic properties where, for example, excitations are created at the corners of big fractal-shaped operators, or the excitations have some restricted, um, some restricted mobility. So either they can't move at all, or maybe just along the line, or maybe just in the plane, and so on. And these have become quite a hot topic because they're hard to understand in terms of the usual frameworks of, say, topological quantum field theory. Um, so they've generated a lot of buzz. Uh, another reason subsystem symmetries recently be, um, it came up is because if you define a symmetry protected topological phase using a subsystem symmetry, you can find phases that are universal for measurement-based quantum computation. So what do I mean by that? Just as a very quick overview, measurement-based a quantum computation is just a scheme of, of computation where all you do is you start with an initially entangled state. So here we could view the state as starting as um, some state on a 2D square lattice. It's some entangled state. And then all you do is single site measurements. And that alone is enough to simulate universal quantum computation in some, in some cases. And of course, what matters then, all of the power is put into your initial state. So, so some states like the 2D cluster state can give you universal computation. Some states like a product state, you can't do anything at all. So a natural question is, um, which states are useful as these kind of resources for measurement-based quantum computation? And what has been shown now um, in, 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 in quite a few scenarios is that these um, states which are in non-trivial subsystem SPT phases are um, examples of universal resources. So the entire physical phase of matter is useful. 
Um, and that gives a nice relationship between condensed metaphysics and um, quantum computation. Um, right, and so for these two reasons, these, these subsystems symmetries are worth studying both, both from the perspectives of condensed matter and quantum info. Right, so to explain the other parts of the um, title, I want to talk about topological order. And throughout this talk, I'll just draw very simple pictures of states or systems. So this picture here just represents some 2D system. And these A and B are excitations of that system. And in general, they could be anions, which means if I take this excitation A and I move it around this excitation B, um, it may have some non some non trivial effect on our ground state subspace. Um, and this is kind of the essence of topological phases and the, the, the way in which these anions braid and fuse can completely classify the different topological phases. Um, right, and so now what I'm, I'm interested in is when you take a topological phase and you enrich it with some symmetry. So you have a topological phase and you take some symmetry group um, called G with an on-site representation UG here by on-site, I mean it acts as a tensor product over every single site in the system um, in the same way. Um, and this representation is linear, so it's just a representation. Um, and it leaves my state invariant. So pictorially, I'll just write this simply like this. I take my 2D system, I apply my symmetry to the entire system, and it leaves my system unchanged. Okay, so, so now I have equipped my topological phase with a symmetry. So now what happens if I have some anions? Well, now if I apply my symmetry to this system, um, what will happen is that far away from these anions, the symmetry will still be satisfied because this is a nice local system. It's a ground state of a local Hamiltonian. Um, but there might still be some non-trivial action near these anions. And so we can write that this symmetry UG um, when acting on this state is equivalent to kind of a tensor product of these two actions, which are localized near the anions and what and what turns out is that while ug is a representation of your symmetry group these v's need only be a representation up to a phase so this phase here is omega here um, and as long as the phase of the two particles here or in general any number of um, particles as long as these phases all cancel out such that the total representation is linear this is still allowed and when you have some non-trivial omega here, you call this you call this symmetry fractionalization, and it's a very um, important thing in 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 this in this topic. For example, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, people like to, 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 like to say how an electron splits into three things, each with um, each with one third of a elementary charge, and that's saying that the anions in that in that um, system carry a fractional charge, which is a, which is a example of, of this fractionalization. And for example, if, if you have a system with spin rotation symmetry, you might have that your whole state is in a singlet state, but these anions might carry some non-trivial spin with them. These are both examples of fractionalization. Uh, so now what happens if we try to analyze this in the context of subsystem symmetries? So here I have again my 2D system and I act with a 1D subsystem symmetry. So it acts non-trivially only along this strip. Well, again, we can decompose this into a product of two actions localized by the, the, the two anions. So it seems as though we can go through all of the same argument and we can get subsystem symmetry fractionalization. Um, but a simple argument shows that this doesn't work, namely, I could instead consider a state where I have moved this anion B outside of the support of my symmetry. And now this subsystem symmetry is just equivalent to a single local action. And because the total symmetry must be linear, this single local symmetry action must also be linear. Um, so this shows that when you have a subsystem symmetry, you cannot have fractionalization um, um, when you have these, um, when you have these mobile point-like anions, which is always the case for 2D topological phases. Um, now there are two loopholes around this argument. The first one is that if you have anions which have restricted um, mobility. Now this doesn't happen in 2D, but in 3D, as we've seen, we can have these things like fractons, um, where it's not possible to move the anion outside of the plane of the 
um, outside of the support of the subsystem symmetry. And so this argument doesn't work. And another example, which we will use here, or rather another loophole, is if you have higher dimensional excitations. So not point-like, but rather loop-like. Okay, so now I want to uh, actually construct an example of a subsystem SET, and it will be in three dimensions. And to do that, I first wanna show you a simple recipe, which is quite intuitive of how you can create a SET um, in 2D. And I, the starting point here is the toric code, which we saw in the previous talk. It's this Hamiltonian of qubits on the edges of a square lattice, where you have this Z, to, um, Z interaction around vertices and X around plaquettes. And what I want to point out here is the structure of the ground states of this Hamiltonian. Namely, if we label the um, states on these edges, where, the, where if the qubit is in zero, we leave it uncolored, and if it's in one, we color it in. You can see that the the um, the states which minimize the energy of these z terms all form closed loops because there must be an even number of lines going into every vertex to minimize these this um, z interaction. And furthermore, when you apply this x um, this x term onto the state, what you do is you flip a whole loop, um, but that won't break any loops. It will just take you to a new loop pattern. And indeed, you can get between all different loop patterns by applying these plaquette operators. And so the ground state of the toric code is what we call a loop soup. It's a superposition over all of these different loop configurations. Okay. Um, right. And this loop picture gives a very nice way to see one of the types of um, anions which you have in the toric code. So namely, let's take our ground state, which is this loop soup. So here I have the empty configuration. Here's some loop configuration. And let's apply some string of X operators along the line. Um, now what will happen is along that line, we'll flip the states and the resulting state will have open strings um, with endpoints at the endpoints of this string operator. So here it's an open string like this. Here it's an open string like this. I just show it in two cases to show that in, um, in each one of these um, terms in the, in the sum, we always have an, uh, um, endpoints of open strings at these two points. And at these endpoints, you violate the vertex term, which wants to have an even number of lines going into every vertex. And so that's an excitation. And so excitations in the tort code, at least one kind of them, appear at the endpoints of these open strings of operators. Okay, so that's a nice way to visualize one type of excitation. Okay, the other ingredient I need to create a symmetry enriched topological order is symmetry protected topological order. So here I'm showing again, very simply, this red ring is a 1D state on a ring. And I say that it has a symmetry. So if I apply my symmetry to this whole state, it leaves it an invariant. And what can happen is that if you now take an open string and you apply your symmetry to it, um, in general, you will need to, you will need, uh, or, or in general, this will have some leftover effect on the boundaries of your open string. And just like in the previous case, these, 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 these operators can um, um, maybe representations only up to a phase. Um, and if that happens, we say that the, the symmetry fractionalizes on the boundary of the 1D system. And one thing that that implies is you have a degeneracy on the boundary. Um, so for example, with spin notation symmetry, you have the famous Haldane phase or the AKLT state where even though it's a chain of spin ones, you effectively get these spin one half degrees of freedom on the boundary. And also the 1D cluster state is an example of a 1D SPT order. Okay, now I have my two ingredients. So how do I make a symmetry enriched topological order? Well, I just take my loop soup and I make the loops red. Well, what have I done here? I, have a, I just mean that on the left-hand side, I have a sum over string, string configurations where along strings qubits are in the one state whereas away from strings are in the zero state but on the right hand side i have put spts along these strings and what it, and what i mean is that the qubits along these strings are put into a uh, into some 1d state having spt order so uh, so in general i can make them you know into any ground state of a local um local hamiltonian that I want. And so here I choose to put 1D SPTs along my loops. And there's many ways to do this decoration. Um, 
but in this case, but in this talk, I won't fuss about the specific way of doing this. It's just the picture is now we no longer have a soup of trivial loops, but rather SPT loops. And now okay. I want question. Yep. What do you put on the edges that course that previously were qubits in the state zero? What what do you put there on the right? I will put um, degrees of freedom which transform trivially under the symmetry. So basically, the product states under the symmetry. Where where symmetry? I mean the symmetry that that defines the SPT order. Thank you. Right, and that's important for my next slide because now if you take any any element of this um, SPT loop soup and I act with the symmetry here, where the symmetry is the is the symmetry of the symmetry protected phase um, away from these loops as I just said we put states which locally um, uh, which are which are trivially symmetric and so the action of this symmetry just reduces to something around the loops but we know that the loops are symmetric oops, um, by definition so now the entire soup has inherited the symmetry of our SVTs. So now I've taken my topological order, I've equipped it with a symmetry, and now I want to show that there's fractionalization. Well, and now I showed you that fractionalization, or that rather the anions appear at the endpoints of open strings. And so now I do the same thing. The action of my symmetry will reduce to some action near the endpoints of these open strings. And if this is a 1D SPT, these endpoints coincide with the boundary of a 1D SPT. So there's fractionalization. So, so, so for example, this will mean that just like on the boundaries of, an, of a 1D SPT, these anions will carry some local degeneracy with them. For example, these spin states in a spin liquid. Right, so this is a nice kind of intuitive picture where you can kind of combine topological order with symmetry protected topological order to create symmetry enriched topological order. Okay, and now I want to apply this idea in 3D to constrain to construct my subsystem symmetry enriched phase. So to do this, my starting point is now the 3D toric code, which is now a state, which is now a state, uh, a system where I have qubits on the faces of a cubic lattice, and I have these two kinds of terms. And now, as before, if I if I indicate these states with zeros um, being blank faces and one being colored faces the ground states of this um, of this system um, form for or, or or rather the states which satisfy these z interaction form closed membranes and the x term flips between membrane configurations so while the 2d toric code is a loop soup the 3d toric code can be viewed as a membrane soup um, where you have this fluctuating soup of all these membrane configurations Okay, and now what about the excitations in a 3D toric code? Well, now the most natural ones in this picture are not point-like, but rather loop-like, because if I consider an open membrane, then I violate the, the, the Z interaction around every edge on this membrane, and so I kind of get a loop-like excitation like this, which is, which is better thought of as a 1D object than, um, than a 0D one. So in the 3D toric code, we get loop-like excitations on the boundary of open membrane operators. All right. Now the next ingredient I need, like before, is subsystem SPT order. So what is this? So now here I have a 2D state represented by the square with a boundary represented by the thick red line. And, and it has a subsystem symmetry. So if I act with this um, with the symmetry along a line, it leaves my state invariant, except at the boundaries where you may again have some non-trivial um, effect. Um, and the kind of um, non-trivial effect which I am looking for here is the, is the kind of fractionalization which is characteristic of subsystem SPD phases, namely when these neighboring line sy symmetries in the bulk, um, while they commute in the bulk, they will locally anti-commute near these boundaries. Um, and what this leads to is an extensive boundary degeneracy of these systems. And the canonical example of this is the 2D cluster state, 
which is also the economical resource for measurement-based quantum computation. Okay, now I have my two ingredients. How do I make a subsystem symmetry-enriched phase? Well, I simply make my membranes red. So what have I done here? Rather than having these 2D membranes just be trivial states of ones, they are now put into um, 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 states having subsystem SPT order. So I have made now a, a SSPT membrane soup. And now I want to argue to you that this is the kind of order that we should call subsystem symmetry enriched topological order. And I want to show you some interesting properties it has. Um, so first, what are its symmetries? Um, and so by definition, the membranes, namely the SSPTs, they have line-like symmetries. So what does this mean for the membrane soup, um, which defines the SSET? Because we call it, in the previous case, the symmetry of the SPT um, was inherited by the SET. Um, but here, because it's subsystem symmetries, it's not quite so, um, it's not quite so clear. Um, there was a quick question from the Q&A, which I can address, which says, um, is there a nice exposition of this term, in uh, of this in terms of corbord, in terms of, in terms of cobordism? Particularly, the decoration brings to mind some of the defect TQFT constructions that operated by decorating the cobordism category. Yeah, so this, my answer is, I have no idea, but I think it's definitely is possible, especially given the success of these kinds of ideas in describing these um, fracton types of phases, which are very close to this kind of, um, in kind of model space to, to what I'm talking about. So I can't give a better answer than that yet, but um, it's definitely something I would be interested in discussing. And, um, and I think some of my co-authors could also have some interesting comments on that. Thanks. Um, okay, right. So I want to see what is the symmetry of our soup. And here's how we figure that out. So what I'm showing here is a 3D state, or, or rather one element of my membrane soup. So I have these 3D, or rather these 2D membranes are these red blobs living in my 3D space. Um, and this gray plane is my plane uh, is, and now I want to imagine acting with symmetry on this gray plane. So again, um, by definition, I make it so that away from the, sorry, this is a typo, it should say locally away from membranes. So by definition, the symmetry is satisfied away from the red membranes by construction. And so the action of this planar symmetry just reduces to an action at the 1D intersections of the planes and membranes, which are marked by these dotted lines. But we, but we know by definition that these red blobs have 1D line-like symmetries. And so this plane is a symmetry of the whole soup. And so the SSET, the state we have constructed, actually has planar subsystem symmetries that it inherits from the line-like subsystem symmetries of the decorating membranes. Okay, and now what about the excitations? Well, before in the 2D case, we had that the, the excitations coincided with the edge of an SPT, so they had fractionalization. Here it's the same thing. Now our loop-like excitations coincide with the boundary of a SSPT, and so we again get this fractionalization. And in this case, the nature of it is that the loop-like excitations now carry an extensive degeneracy with them. So there is a protected degeneracy which grows like the length of, of the loop. And that can kind of be seen as the, the key feature of, of these SSET phases. Okay, um, right. Um, now to summarize this picture I showed at the start, what this is representing here is here on the left, I have a membrane, a closed membrane, and I'm showing how the, pla uh, the planar symmetry intersects my membrane along a line. And so my, and so because the membrane has, satisfies that line symmetry, my whole soup satisfies the plane symmetry. On the right here, I have an open membrane with a boundary indicated by these, by this red line. And here now, the planar symmetry will have some non-trivial action where it intersects this boundary. And 
there's always an even number of intersections. And because of this kind of conservation law that this number is even, we're allowed to have fractionalization. And this is how we get away from my argument in 2D, is because here now this plane will always have an even number of intersections um, with, the, with the excitations. OK, so that's the basics of the construction. Um, now I want to tell you some properties, some more, some more or properties of this system which we have constructed. The first one has to do with the area law. So the area law is a statement where if you take, say, a system here as a 2D system on a cylinder and you divide it into two parts, A and B, and you want to say how entangled is system A with B, and you can measure this by the entanglement entropy, this S here, um, it turns out that for ground states of gapped local Hamiltonians, there's an area law which says that the entanglement between A and B scales only like the size of the boundary between them. So that's this first term here is the, the, the area law term. Um, but in some cases, there can be a constant correction to the area law, this gamma. And this gamma is usually associated with topological order, where it's called the topological entanglement entropy. And it's a key, it's a key signature of topological phases. Uh, but recently, it's been, it, it's been shown that also for states with SSPT order, this gamma can be non-zero, as long as the, the, the structure of, your, of, your, of the bipartition um, matches that of the structure of the symmetries. And in this case, we've called it the symmetry-protected entanglement entropy to, to it, it differentiate it from the topological entanglement entropy. Um, and so, and this SSET we've constructed somehow has elements of both topological order and SSPT order. So if we were to calculate this gamma, what would we find? Um, so this is the geometry on which I calculate it. This here is a three-dimensional torus. So the opposite faces of this 3D um, cube are identified. And I'm selecting one particular ground state out of my out of my ground space, um, out of the ground state subspace, um, according to the eigenvalues of these Wilson operators, but it's not so important. Um, the point here is that if you calculate the entropy of this slice of, of this torus A, um, you get out an area law term, and then you get out a correction, which is twice that from what you would expect from the normal 3D toric code. Um, I have these factors of of two here it's just because we have these two boundaries, um, but those can be ignored. Um, and so rather than saying that the, the topological entanglement is, um, tw is twice that of the Torah code, we would like to, to say that it is accompanied also by a symmetry protected entanglement entropy, which takes the same value to, um, as the topological entanglement entropy. So here you have kind of both of these effects playing and you would think that the the part due to symmetry is robust only to perturbations which respect the symmetry whereas the part due to the topological order would be robust to all perturbations okay uh, the next property i want to talk about is what happens if you gauge the subsystem symmetries so as we've seen a few times in this talk um, like especially in nat's talk where he used the term kramers vanier which is which is where, which I am calling gauging. Um, we've seen that it's a useful way to relate and understand um, a different um, SPT orders and topological orders. Um, and so, um, and in this case, we expect something interesting might happen because on one hand, when you gauge a fractionalized symmetry in 2D, you can get out non-abelian topological order even though everything started abelian, like your symmetry group and your topological order, if it's fractionalized, you can get something non-abelian. But on, and, uh, on the other hand, um, when you gauge these subsystem symmetries, you will generally get out these, um, these topological excitations with restricted mobility, namely these fracton models. So since we have both of these, what do you, what do you think we will find? Um, we'll think some sort of fractionalized fracton model. Um, and to 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 do this calculation, we don't we don't 
gauge the subsystem symmetries directly, rather we take the long route. So first we take our SSET and we ungauge the, the global symmetry. So what does that mean? Well, we just ask which state can we find which has both global symmetries and subsystem symmetries such that when you gauge only the global part, you get out our SSET. And this, we, and this is a model um, and this is a model of SSPT order. I put the S in brackets because it has both subsystem and, uh, uh, and global symmetries. Um, and then we can take this model and gauge the subsystem symmetries of that model. And what we will get out is some fracton model, which we can understand. And finally, we gauge the global symmetries of that fracton model. And luckily, thanks to some recent papers, um, one of them being, being by Dominic, um, we can understand what will happen as a result of this final gauging. Um, and, we, and we would think that, that this whole process will, will um, commute um, in this case, and such that, this, such that the model we get out is equivalent to that one if we had just gauged the subsystem symmetries from the start. And so what do we get out from this procedure? Well, we get out some weird thing that's been called non-abelian panoptic order which is something where you have both mobile point-like and loop-like excitations, like in a topological phase, but they coexist and they braid non-trivially with, with fracton type excitations. So this picture shows an example of a loop-like excitation being, being braided around a, um, um, a fracton excitation here represented by this X. And this can lead to non-trivial statistical phases. And it has other interesting things such as, um, these non-abelian loop-like excitations will have a degeneracy, which it depends not only on their topology, but their geometry, which is very strange. And also these fractons, which come in sets, will have some, will come with some degeneracy, which depends on their relative positions. So there's a lot of strange things that happen in this model. And I think it's still not entirely understood um, how it fits in in general with these things and what, what, what we can do with it. Um, but it shows that our model of SSET order kind of fits into this world of both the global and subsystem sy symmetries with the kind of the, the final form of that being these panoptic models. And just as a quick aside, there's actually a lot more models we can come up with because our original state has global symmetries and we can split the subsystem symmetries into those acting um, in plane and on the dual planes. And so we effectively have three different kinds of symmetry, which we can, to, which we can cho choose to gauge independently, which leads to eight different models. And each one of these has some interesting features and, and a different notion of subsystem symmetry enrichment. Okay, so now I'd just like to conclude. Um, I first tried to show you that you can make SETs intuitively by taking a topological order and decorating it with lower dimensional SPTs. I applied this principle to a 3D topological order and SSPTs, and we constructed the first model of subsystem symmetry in rich topological order. So what are some open problems? Well, this is just one example, and the network I just showed you on the previous slide shows that there's many other things that, that can happen. So, there's still a lot of questions to be answered about the interplay of subsystem symmetries and topological order. And of course, relevant to the current workshop, um, this SSET model, it combines features of SSPTs, which we know are useful for measurement-based quantum computation, and of topological phases, which we know are useful for both topological quantum computation and um, robust quantum memories. So there's some hope that, that this model, which combines features of both, could be used um, for some application in quantum computation. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions if anyone wants to ask. Oh, there'll be a pause. <laughs> yep, so if anyone has a question, Nat has a hand up. Yep, Nat. Yeah, so in in this in the, the in the fracton model with the enriched by global symmetry here, you have symmetry fractionalization, but in the in in Dominic's other paper, 
you have the, the, the symmetry acts on the fracton model as like a permutation. So do you expect the, after you gauge the global symmetry, the fractons will behave differently, right. the, the non-abelian ones. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so are you referring to, to, yeah, to, this, model. to this, yeah. this middle step fracton model? Right. Yeah. This one actually, the enrichment is also due to permutation. So, okay. so when you do this gauging, you're left over with a global symmetry and it has the effect of, per, of doing fracton permutation. So it is, a, so it is exactly like um, the model in Dominic's paper. Oh, but on the SSCT on the right, it's uh, fractionalization. On the right, it's fractionalization exactly, and so so and so and so. This this tells you that the effect of gauging a fractionalized loop excitation is the same as gauging kind of permutations of fractons somehow. I see. Thank you. Can I make one comment on that? So mm -hmm. it's somewhat analogous to like having the Z two cubed. Um, C2 to the power of three, type three co-cycle, SPT in 2D. Um, if you gauge all of it, you get like a non-abelian D4 gauge theory. But if you gauge like part of it one way, you can get like a Z2 times Z2 uh, order with anion permutation. And if you gauge like one of the Z2s instead of two of them, you get um, a Z2 topological order with symmetry enrichment. And this is like, seems to be something like it, some, you know, Z2 times Z2 times Z2 mixed gauge mm -hmm. theory with subsystem and normal gauge fields that has something like this type of three cycle. But that's slightly vague. <laughs> that's just a big picture we imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so I have a question. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any intuition as to like, uh, if there's any sort of like general tensor network construction that we can take for these SSCT models? Right, so this model certainly we have one, um, and and it has some s s some nice features. So so we have an understanding of how topological order looks in tensor networks. We have an understanding of how subsystem SPT order looks in tensor networks, and indeed, if you stare at the tensor network for this model, it somehow has both of those effects, and they have some non-trivial inter um, intertwinement between them. Um, so you can indeed write down tensor networks. They have low bond dimension and they seem interesting, um, but, we haven't but we haven't taken it further than that yet. I mean, did, did these also have some like uh, non-trivial quantum cellular automaton living in the virtual space or? So uh, I, I would, th I think yes, if you look hard enough, but it's, but it's, I mean, so like the topological part of it won't, but because there's this SSPT part in there, there should be, but because these membranes can kind of curve and move around, um, it's not so clear, but you can definitely see, see s signatures of it. But um, understanding a, 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 a better how that structure appears in the tensor network um, would probably give a clue of how to use this state, for example, possibly for measurement-based quantum computation. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, great. Um, any more questions from the audience? I guess I have another question. Uh, does it generalize to fractal SPT, SETs? Can you do that? Um, not yet. So, one one weird aspect, which I, which which is kind of maybe the first thing which comes to your head, if you would want to, okay. So the first way of, you would think of doing this is rather than putting linear SSPTs on the on the membranes, you put fractal SSPTs. Um, but then what would be the symmetry of the whole soup? Because because you would maybe have like these 3D fractals which intersect your membranes and the intersections form 2D fractals on, it's it's not clear. Um, so so just the structure of the symmetries, how it w would work is is unclear. Um, I think such a thing, it can be done, but we haven't done it yet. Um, any more questions? 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned that the non-abelian fractal model has a, <clears throat> a degeneracy that depends on the position of the fractons. Yeah. So how, do, how does that work? Uh, so I think Dom can answer this better than I can, but basically, so, so these fractons, for example, they must come in some, in some compatible sets. So, so like, you know, if they could come at the corners of, uh, or at the four corners of a plane, or you could multiply that by a second plane and have them be at kind of the corners of like a prism or something. And no matter how you do, or, and in these different ways they appear, the um, non-abelian degeneracy, which they carry, is different. Um, the precise way in which it is different, I don't know. I see. But normally you define the degeneracy when they're like infinitely far apart, right? And then... Yeah, and this, and this apparently isn't possible in this model. At least that was my understanding. I see. That's weird. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I guess you could define it by having different ways of preparing the same excitations uh, from the from the ground state, like the different operators that give you orthogonal states. And then depending on the position of the excitations, there can be more or less ways to do that. Because the, the operators you use to prepare them are kind of rigid, if that makes sense. But mm. yeah, it's kind of weird and intractable to describe everything about these, well, so far, these weird non-abelian fractal models. Thanks. Um, yeah, does anyone else have a question? Maybe, maybe I have a question here, Robert here. Maybe I missed it. Uh, David, but um, the way I understand it, you, you, you and Dominic, you are constructing a ground state. Uh, but do you have Hamiltonians that give these, I mean, kind of nice, Hamiltonians with nice properties that give these gr states as their ground states? Yes. So I talked about it from the perspective of, of ground states. So you could have this physical picture of the states, but this whole conversation could have been on the level of of Hamiltonians in, um, instead. And it's a nice gapped local Hamiltonian. Um, and, um, and indeed, you can relate it to, to a product of a 3D torque code Hamiltonian with some, with just a paramagnet by some, um, by some quantum circuit, but that circuit breaks the symmetry um, in the same way as usual, kind of. So, so yes, it's a nice, well-behaved Hamiltonian, it, and it lets us um, understand the excitations and their degeneracy and whatnot. Thank you. Great. I think we still have time for more questions if anyone else has thought of something they want to ask. Maybe I can ask one thing. So you were mentioning about how it might be possible to use it for MBQC, but mm -hmm. what kind of scheme are you imagining? You're imagining to make like a defect in the model and then use that, or do you have some picture in mind? Yeah, I'm, I, I really don't have a, um, a, a good picture in mind yet. So certainly I was thinking of kind of rather thinking of the role of these subsystem symmetry defects and maybe you know if you take a loop excitation and wind a defect around it you can get some some i mean i guess that would just apply the symmetry so it's not so useful but yeah i i i really have no idea so far <laughs> um yeah unfortunately i can't say anything more than that in um 2d there could be like a similar kind of construction that you showed earlier where you decorate the lines with 1D yeah. cluster states. Do people know how to like use that kind of top word SET and 2D to do like just 1D wire computation? Yeah, I was looking that up. Um, certainly, I, I haven't seen, seen anyone talk about it in the context of like, you know, a topological a, a quantum computation. So whether or not you can use these defects to give gates in the same way you can with like a anion permuting symmetry. I haven't seen that done and I can't see really what that would do. 
um, in terms of maybe measurement-based quantum computation, um, I'm also not sure. It's known that the toric code is not useful for measurement-based quantum computation, but maybe giving this enrichment gives it what it what it needs, and that and that could be a, um, a, tract a tractable first step to uh, to see what the role of this symmetry enrichment is. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, yeah, if anyone else would like to ask a question, we lost chance. Otherwise, I guess we should head to the discussion room. Anyone who wants to keep discussing until the next talk.